Good morning and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Michael Friedman, the 113th President of the National Press Club. I'm the former General Manager of CBS Radio Network, now Journalist in Residence at University of Maryland Global Campus and Executive Producer of the public broadcasting series The Kalb Report with legendary journalist Marvin Kalb. I'm joining you today from the National Press Club Broadcast Operations Center here in Washington, D.C. Our guest, American Medical Association President Dr. Patrice Harris, joins us virtually from Atlanta. Dr. Harris is serving a one-year term as the 174th President of the largest association of physicians and medical students in the United States. She is the first African-American woman to hold the position and brings to the role several decades as a physician in private practice, as well as a public health administrator, patient advocate, and medical society lobbyist. When she took office in June of 2019, Dr. Harris pledged to bring her work on the front lines of the opioid crisis to the forefront. Today, of course, Dr. Harris is here to talk with us about an entirely different public health crisis and why in this era of conspiracy theories and fake news, she believes we must return to a reliance on scientific facts, data, and trusted sources. Dr. Patrice Harris, welcome to the National Press Club, our virtual podium, is yours. Thank you and greetings. I am Dr. Patrice Harris, president of the American Medical Association. The coronavirus pandemic presents a challenge the world has not faced on this scale for generations. It's often said that extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures and we are witnessing every day the heroic efforts of physicians nurses, medical workers, public health professionals, and the public to manage the enormity of COVID-19 in our communities. But extraordinary times often call for the most basic of responses. For physicians, this means the routine collection of facts and evidence and examination of research that has been foundational in medicine since its origins. We live in a time when misinformation, falsehoods, and outright lies spread like viruses online, through social media, and even at times in the media at large. We have witnessed a concerning shift over the last several decades where policy decisions seem to be driven by ideology and politics instead of facts and evidence. The result is a growing mistrust in American institutions, in science, and in the council of leading experts whose lives are dedicated to the pursuit of evidence and reason. In these challenging times, I am addressing the nation to make an appeal for science in defeating this disease, to explain why physicians and scientists rely on facts and evidence in carrying out our duties, and to remind the public of its responsibility to help turn the tide against COVID-19. I know people are frightened. You are afraid for yourselves and for your family. You are concerned about catching the virus and you are worried about spreading the virus to others. Many of you have lost jobs or are trying to keep a small business afloat. Many are working from home and caring for children whose schools have closed. You have missed graduations and milestone birthdays. As a psychiatrist, I understand the fears and sense of loss we are all experiencing and that they are weighing heavily on our minds and affecting our mental health. Fear and anxiety are natural human emotions in a time of crisis. But as we have seen in the last few weeks, panic can lead to troubling consequences. Hoarding of food and supplies, spreading of misinformation, and mistrusting the motives of others. It is absolutely okay to be afraid, but please do not let panic guide your actions. And so on behalf of our nation's physicians, I ask you to respond instead with reason 
and resolve. Physicians, nurses, researchers, and public health experts throughout the world are working tirelessly to contain this pandemic, to develop new tests, to develop treatments, and to create a vaccine. But this will take some time. In the meantime, we must exercise good judgment, believe what the science and evidence is telling us, and be flexible in changing our behavior as our knowledge improves. We do not yet know everything we would like to know about COVID-19, but there is plenty we do know. Transmission occurs primarily from person to persons in close contact. Anyone can become infected. This virus does not discriminate. Seniors and those living with chronic disease are much more vulnerable to serious illness from this virus than others. Many more people are carriers for COVID-19 than have been tested as they may be asymptomatic or experiencing only mild symptoms, they pose a risk to others. So the most effective tool we have in this fight at this moment is physical distancing, which means every city and state that has not yet implemented shelter in place or stay at home restrictions needs to do so immediately. Based on what we know, and what has already worked in other countries and indeed in our country, this is our best chance to slow the spread of the virus. As a physician, I am honored to be a member of one of our country's most trusted professions. People trust their physicians because they know we do not act on whims or hunches or personal opinions. We take an oath to treat people ethically, and we go where the evidence leads. Now, this was not always the case. The origins of modern epidemiology date to 19th century London, when a physician ended a severe cholera outbreak long thought to be the result of breathing bad air. By studying the location of cases, he discovered the real cause was drinking water from a public pump that had become contaminated by sewage. The American Medical Association itself was founded in 1847 as a response to rampant quackery in medicine. At the time, syrups or serums were sold as cures for various diseases that not only did not help, they often caused harm. The AMA fought to center the practice of medicine around a set of established standards and principle and to develop a code of ethics. And our mission since then has been to promote the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. The role of America's physicians in this pandemic is, of course, to care for patients with COVID-19 using the best, most up-to-date evidence available. But as skilled as physicians and other healthcare workers are, and as hard as they are working in our hospitals and clinics and offices and intensive care units, they cannot carry this burden alone. Everyone has a role to play in containing this pandemic. The strategies we are asking the public to universally adopt may seem simplistic, but they are in fact based in science and evidence. Physicians and public health experts are asking everyone to wash their hands, for example. Now children learn even before preschool that washing their hands reduces the spread of germs. But how do we know this? The evidence. It may be hard to believe, but in the mid 1800s, many healthcare workers did not wash their hands between patients until the link was made between hand washing and a reduction in disease. Many women died before studies found that maternity patients had a lower risk of disease and death 
if their physicians wash their hands between patients. Hand washing became a necessary protocol for physicians and now more than ever for everyone in society. We are asking for social distancing, or as I prefer to call it, physical distancing, because we can and should still strive to have meaningful social interactions while maintaining a safe physical distance. We know this is very difficult for people, but we know from history it is effective. A century ago, the United States and the world faced a pandemic of influenza known as the 1918 flu. Major cities varied in their approach to physical distancing. And as a result, their death rates varied widely. As described recently in National Geographic, Philadelphia reported its first case of influenza on September the 17th, 1918. Days later, they held a war bonds parade attended by 200,000 people. Sadly, two weeks later, at least 20,000 city residents had contracted the flu. Now contrast Philadelphia's approach with that of St. Louis. St. Louis had the benefit of watching what was happening on the East Coast and public officials acted quickly. Two days after the first case was reported, the city of St. Louis shut down. Two cities, two different approaches to physical distancing and two different death rates. By the end of the epidemic, St. Louis had half the death rate of Philadelphia. So let us use the experience of a century ago as a guide for today. If the citizens of Philadelphia knew then what we know now of the direct link between a large social gathering and a spike in cases, there is little doubt that they would have chosen not to attend that parade. We are also asking that physical distancing measures not be relaxed prematurely. We understand that people are suffering great financial and emotional pain in having much of the economy shut down in not being able to gather with their loved ones. Here too, the evidence from the 1918 pandemic is instructive for today. A retrospective study in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as school closures and bans on public gatherings were beneficial and should be sustained throughout the peak of a pandemic. Further, cities acting in a timely and comprehensive manner experienced lower death rates. The AMA is encouraged by those federal and state leaders who are willing to keep physical distancing restrictions, restrictions in place until the evidence suggests it is safe to return to normal. Today, we repeat our call for governors who have not yet implemented physical distancing in their states to do so immediately. Now, in truth, the nation needs more much more from our leaders. The public is already making incredible sacrifices by acting on the evidence. All of us need to trust that our institutions are also keeping science at the fore of their decision-making. And so with that in mind, the AMA calls on all elected officials to affirm science, evidence, and fact in their words and their actions. We call on media to be vigilant in communicating factual information from credible sources and to challenge those who choose to trade in misinformation. We call on tech platforms to advance evidence-based information from credible sources and reduce the spread of misinformation. 
We call on our government scientific institutions now and in the future to be led by experts protected from political influence. We call for an environment in which physicians, scientists, and other experts are free to communicate evidence-based factual information without fear of retaliation or retribution. We call for determinations about safety and efficacy of drugs to be made by scientists and researchers based on the data and that treatment decisions should be made via a shared decision-making process between a patient and his or her physician without intrusion by any third party, government or otherwise. We call for the robust collection of data, including data segmented by race and ethnicity to make sure we have a thorough understanding of the pandemic's impact on every community. Some have called the response to this pandemic a war. We must ensure the war is against the virus and not against science. Despite solid evidence behind the public health measures now in place, misinformation about COVID-19 is spreading rapidly, even intentionally due to fear or to various political agendas. You may have heard some of these false claims yourself. African-Americans are less likely to get COVID-19. That is false. Coronavirus is a new way to force vaccinations on people who don't want them, also false. And children cannot contract COVID-19, false. Believing these kinds of rumors and conspiracy theories inevitably leads to more illness, more suffering, and more death. And that's why we all have a responsibility to seek out and share information only from credible sources. America has faced and overcome enormous public health challenges before greatly reducing smoking, finding treatments for HIV and AIDS, eradicating polio and other vaccine preventable diseases. Challenges that required changes in thinking, changes in public policy and changes in behavior. We must approach COVID-19 in the same way by relying on the science and evidence to inform our decisions and our actions. With this new pandemic, there are many unknowns. It is critically important, however, that we go back to the core principles and core knowledge we have relied on in the past. As evidence evolves, necessarily our strategy, tactics, and behaviors should change accordingly. It is science, research, and evidence, and not wishful thinking or ideology that gives us hope as we face uncertainties around this pandemic. It is science that will bring about proven treatments for COVID-19. It is science that will bring about a vaccine. Every person in this nation shares accountability in fighting this virus. And we all have a responsibility to do our part. At times like these, we may feel a sense of helplessness or hopelessness, but we are not powerless in this health crisis. We must all commit to evidence-based actions to fight this disease. In closing, I offer my most heartfelt thanks to all of the physicians, nurses, and health professionals who are heroically fighting this pandemic. 
I also want to thank those who are cleaning our facilities and cooking our meals and delivering our food. And finally, to all of those who are taking the necessary steps to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, I now have a series of questions submitted by members of the National Press Club. Uh, for those of you joining us by live stream today, you're also welcome to submit questions online, and I will ask as many as possible. I'd like to first tap into your expertise as a psychiatrist. Uh, you talked about the emotional and psychological impact of the coronavirus crisis and um, how we can all best deal with that. And you mentioned uh, changes in behavior, which are generally easier said than done. Um, how does one calm oneself down uh, right now? What are, some, what are some practical ways that people can um, uh, remain reasonable uh, in the current situation? Well, just a few uh, practical tips, and I urge everyone to rely on their usual uh, coping skills, I think the first thing is to make sure you have reliable information. Misinformation often leads to fear. Uh, I do tell uh, everyone, myself included, that sometimes you just have to take a moment and breathe. Every morning I would take a few minutes uh, to get centered on the day. Sometimes you have to, uh, you know, take off, cut off uh, the television and uh, take a break from social media. Um, we should all be getting exercise. Um, if you have the privilege uh, of being able to, to walk safely around your neighborhood, get outside again, keeping in mind that you want to make sure you are doing the appropriate physical uh, distancing. Um, but if you can't, uh, you could exercise uh, indoors. I say put on your favorite song and just make sure you keep moving. Uh, we should all try to get as much sleep as we can um, and eat as healthily as, as we can. So those are just a, a few uh, a tips. And really uh, experience those feelings. There's, no one should beat themselves up for being more anxious or worried. Uh, those are normal feelings. And I'll just say one more thing. Um, there is a huge disruption in our routines. And so it's probably a good idea uh, to develop new routines, uh, because routines also uh, will help us uh, get through some of the fear and the anxiety. A lot of people are finding new routines, um, uh, um, not necessarily by design, but by necessity. Uh, they may be working from home um, with a spouse or partner and perhaps with children around them who are now uh, being distance schooled uh, for uh, an indeterminate uh, amount of time. Your training is in child and adolescent psychiatry. Uh, what should, first of all, we be telling our children, our grandchildren, to help them best cope with this and talk a little bit about dealing with this in this um, forced new environment that a lot of people find themselves in? I think the first thing parents should commit to parents and other caregivers is to have age appropriate uh, conversations. Uh, and children often, children and adolescents guide us in their conversations, answer their questions, uh, but certainly in age appropriate ways. Um, I also think we should all be careful not to ascribe feelings, particularly to our children. For example, uh, rather than saying, I know you are afraid, uh, you don't want to lead with that because, in fact, they may be curious. They may not be afraid. Uh, certainly, I believe uh, initially maybe our, our, our children and adolescents were, were uh, happy maybe for a school break. And so rather than ascribing feelings, I should say, how are you doing today? Um, what routines, what would you like to do? What do you think about our new routine? I mean, ask open-ended questions, get feedback from them, and then provide age-appropriate information. I do think though, and, and listen, even adults are, are worried, but be mindful that our children are watching. 
And uh, if you're anxious, uh, they will get anxious. So again, not uh, recommending that uh, parents or caregivers hide their, their, their feelings, uh, but certainly be mindful uh, that our youth are watching. Have you been in touch uh, with the White House? And, and a second part of that is uh, who from the administration are you listening to with respect to uh, COVID-19? Well, certainly early on, I had the opportunity along with some other uh, leaders of physician organizations to participate um, in a conference call with the president and the members of the task force. And at that time, we were able uh, to bring up concerns uh, from the physician community. And uh, since then, I've had um, other conversations with some members of the, the task force. And listen, as president of the American Medical Association, I have to listen to everyone. I listen to physicians across this country who email me, who call me, who text me. I review the media post. Um, I uh, listen to the media briefings uh, because certainly as the, the physician leader, I want to be informed. I want to hear from everyone. Certainly we at the AMA, and, and of course we have a fantastic team uh, at the AMA, we have our, our team in DC and our team in, in Chicago. The, we are monitoring every bit of information, synth synthesizing that information and making sure we get out credible sources of information. We have a COVID-19 resource page on our website and we wanna make sure we are supporting physicians. Uh, that's why early on um, in this, we sent letters and we have sent many letters to, to Congress and the administration. We wanna make sure that uh, physician practices, uh, large and small, are supported uh, during the, this time. Physicians uh, have, are reducing hours. Certainly we are able to, again, thanks to CMS using uh, telemedicine, uh, but, but certainly it's, had a negative impact, of course, on physicians on the uh, front line, but throughout this country. And so I listen to all information so I can best learn and know how to support not only our, our physician community, but ultimately the patients that we serve. Tying together a lot of the things that you said in your, uh, in your talk and asking people to stay reasonable and calm and not panic in this, reports out of the White House suggest that Officials disagree over the use of the malaria drug hydroxychloroquine as a possible treatment for COVID-19. Um, what's the AMA's position on that drug as, as a treatment for this virus? Well, I think our position is our position that you heard me uh, speak about throughout uh, my address. Science and the evidence have to rule the day. And when we make treatment decisions about COVID-19 or, or any other uh, disease, uh, physicians base those recommendations, of course, in a shared decision-making process uh, with our patients on the evidence and the facts. And so we uh, certainly want uh, the process uh, to play out. Now, absolutely, clinical trials are going on right now. That's how we get the data that we need. And those, some of those clinical trials are using uh, hydroxychloroquine, um, and that is appropriate. We know there is compassionate use, but whatever uh, the situation, physicians don't make recommendations, treatment recommendations, as you heard me say earlier, on whims. There is a decision-making process that physicians go through for every treatment that we recommend, and that should hold, continue to hold through uh, for COVID-19 and anything else we face in the future. Let's talk about the impact the virus is having demographically. Um, there have been multiple reports now that- We learned last evening uh, from the mayor of Chicago uh, surrounding the increased impact, the disproportionate impact on African-Americans there and in New Orleans. So we have to have the data and, uh, and we encourage that data now. We want to be proactive and predictive uh, in targeting particular communities with the resources that they need. We wanna make sure if we see a disproportionate impact anywhere uh, that testing occurs there earlier. Uh, so uh, this is a very important uh, piece 
of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we really uh, urge standardized and robust collection of data across the board. And here we have early evidence that we need to pay particular attention to race and ethnicity. Now, it's not that we think that uh, African Americans are more susceptible to this, uh, but pre-COVID-19, um, African Americans and, and others from communities of color uh, had a disproportionate share of hypertension and diabetes and obesity. And those are risk factors uh, for increased uh, morbidity uh, of the impact of COVID-19. So this is an area that uh, needs and deserves amplification and uh, the AMA will continue to do so. And as we get the data, uh, we will work uh, with, of course, everyone. This is an all in effort uh, to make sure these issues are addressed. And what are your thoughts on antibody testing for, for COVID-19? Yes, yeah, so we are <clears throat> and have been way behind on testing. And so uh, we need to make sure that we ramp up the availability of testing. And of course, that does include antibody testing. Of course, uh, that uh, gives us uh, data and evidence around those who uh, may have uh, had a mild case of the disease or might not even have experienced symptoms at all. And of course, we know there is some promise and hope, it's happened in other disease states, uh, to be able to use um, a convalescent serum, as they say, for treatment. So that is a critical piece of the puzzle as well. So testing, we cannot um, uh, forget about testing as we are in uh, this acute mitigation phase. Some of our uh, most important basic public health principles remain critical, and that's testing and surveillance and tracking and contact tracing um, when possible. The CDC has been revising standards for doctors and nurses as it pertains to personal protective gear. Uh, for instance, uh, hospital employees up until very recently would change masks between every patient in potential infectious situations. Now, some wear the same mask all day. Um, are these standards being lowered to a level that puts the healthcare workers at risk? Well, certainly the availability of PPE um, has been an ongoing issue in some areas. At this point, it, it's better. Uh, that's why the AMA called on the president early on to activate the Defense Production Act so we can really look at the supply chain and make sure we get the equipment um, in the hands and on the bodies of uh, particularly those on the front line, but really everyone uh, who needs uh, that equipment. So we uh, need to continue to elevate the issue of PPE. Um, as we've said early on, um, physicians and nurses and everyone are really working as hard as they can and, and doing what they need to do um, in a time of crisis. Uh, we have noted uh, that reusing masks, uh, as per your question and some of these other issues, pre-COVID-19 uh, might have violated infection control uh, policies and procedures. But again, uh, physicians and nurses and others are doing what they can in this time of crisis. Uh, but we need an all hands on deck to uh, make sure that uh, we have PPE, um, that we have ventilators that we have the test, including the swabs um, and their chemical reagents. Um, and of course, now we're hearing about a shortage of medications that uh, the physicians used uh, to intubate patients. Uh, and so we really need to continue to amplify those issues and make sure uh, shortages of any supplies are addressed. To be sure, this is a, a crisis of epic proportions, uh, and it calls for unusual responses. Um, reports indicate that a number of hospitals have requested help from medical students and others uh, who may not yet have attained professional standards set by the AMA. What, what's the AMA's view of this, especially for students uh, and their safety? 
Well, so again, in times of crisis, uh, in an all hands on deck moment, we've seen uh, some states allow uh, medical uh, students, uh, of course, realize that uh, typically medical students would be graduating around the May and, and June time period. Uh, and so some of these fourth year medical students, uh, of course, meeting a certain set of standards and, and criteria are being called uh, into action, as well as uh, you may know, retired physicians uh, have been called into action. And so uh, certainly, again, uh, we are in extraordinary times. Uh, that being said, and we have this information on our, our website, um, and we have disseminated this information, the AMA wants to make sure uh, that medical students and residents are, are protected. And we've also offered guidance for our retired physicians who are, uh, for the most part, older. And that, in and of itself, um, is a risk factor, again, for the more serious consequences of COVID-19. So. In, in all of these instances, the AMA um, has information and guidance about this on our COVID-19 uh, resource page. We continue to be mindful of the impact on everyone uh, from our medical students to our senior physicians. We will continue to gather information and make sure that um, we are protected, everyone is protected uh, during this time. Is there a need for retraining um, healthcare professionals on how to use ventilators. We hear much about the need for ventilators. Um, there are a lot of physicians who might have learned how to use a ventilator at one time, but uh, uh, could be pretty rusty themselves uh, on, on the use of it. Um, are there brush up courses available for them? Is the AMA involved in any of that? There are brush up courses. Of, we usually leave that to the specialties uh, to uh, determine and lead on those courses, but that is an excellent point. Um, and if you have not uh, managed a, a ventilator, uh, you know, since medical school, uh, I know I have not, uh, you certainly uh, might want to do that. And that is one way we have requested that hospitals and, and systems uh, support uh, their physicians by offering them additional uh, training as needed. We also need to keep in mind that there are so many ways uh, that medical students and uh, physicians and retired physicians can contribute other than uh, direct care. Certainly, I've already mentioned the uh, possibility of telehealth. And again, we appreciate the uh, administration and CMS on relaxing a lot of the regulations and guidelines regarding uh, telehealth in this time. Uh, but medical students, retired physicians, others can uh, be available to triage for phone screening, um, maybe to connect uh, with families when their loved ones are in the hospital and we know there's limited uh, to no visitation. So there are many opportunities and of course, uh, physicians and medical students and residents are answering the call. We take an oath to do so. I've heard from so many of my colleagues, yes, this is an emotionally taxing time for, for all of us particularly those on the front line, but for everyone. We have to actually also remember that health needs don't go away, haven't gone away. People are postponing uh, routine and, and other issues, but they don't go away during this time. So we need to make sure uh, that we continue to provide at least some platform and structure and support uh, for physician practices, uh, large and small. But there are many ways uh, that medical students up through our senior physicians can answer in the call. And of course, uh, physicians, medical students and residents are doing so. What's your sense of when a vaccine might realistically be available for Americans? Well, I have to tell you, I certainly would leave uh, that up to the, the researchers and the experts and, and Dr. Fauci. Uh, I know that uh, there are so many researchers working on this right now. Um, you know, it will take a little bit of time, uh, but, uh, you know, it has to go through the process. We, we want to make sure there's safety and efficacy. And so that's why in the meantime, it is so important for all of us, again, to practice those, those basic um, techniques, the physical distancing and washing our hands and only going out uh, for groceries or for food or for medicines or, or urgent health needs. Um, that is really our best tool at this point. Um, in slowing the spread 
of the pandemic. And we know that there are hot spots today. And you know what? It would be good um, if there are no more hot spots. It, that's difficult to predict, but the best way uh, to prevent that is the physical distancing and the shelter in place um, and, and staying at home. I'm turning my head just to read some questions that are coming in uh, by email from those who are following us online. Uh, this may be a difficult question to answer, but how long after the number of COVID-19 cases consistently declines um, across the country should physical distancing continue to be implemented? Yeah, that, that is an unknown at this point. You know, wish we, we had the answer, but part of that decision will be made uh, by the data. And I believe uh, one area that would go a long way in helping us know exactly when to relax these rules um, is testing. And so as we ramp up testing, um, I, those experts, those leaders, those public health leaders in the state who have all the data will be able to make those decisions. I will have to say that um, we shouldn't uh, think that after we get to the apex or the peak, whatever that is, uh, in whatever whatever area you are, we can relax. It, it, it's not that simple. We will have to be thoughtful. And again, let, let the data lead us on that. But we will need to remain hypervigilant. Um, there will be a new normal after this. There is no question. We will get back. Uh, to some semblance of uh, normalcy, absolutely we will. Um, it will be a new normal. And uh, I can tell you at, at the AMA, we are already thinking about uh, what we, uh, the conversations we should be having around the new normal. We're thinking about that, but that of course is not driving our current work. Currently we have to be focused on preventing uh, further spread, making sure that we are prepared uh, for worst case scenario, of course, not the AMA, that's everyone, states and hospitals and everyone. We want to make sure we are prepared for the worst case scenario. It's okay to hope for the best, uh, but we should be appropriately prepared for a worst case scenario. That's how we uh, will minimize uh, deaths and, Sorry, and suffering. I couldn't quite hear you. Could okay. you please repeat what you said? Um, this may be a difficult question um, uh, uh, to answer. Um, Alcohol sales uh, and unemployment rates uh, are up. Um, are you worried uh, that this pandemic is going to lead to more drug and other substance abuse, depression and anxiety, more suicides? Um, what can be done to combat this right now? Well, certainly, as you know, there's there are a couple of issues here. There's the, the issue of normal um, anxiety and fear. But we also know that that normal anxiety and fear could uh, evolve into uh, clinical depression and anxiety uh, disorders. And so we want to make sure, and, and, and I will say this as a psychiatrist, certainly pre-COVID-19, um, we, we, we certainly uh, did not have the full infrastructure we've needed uh, for mental health services. But during this period of time, there are resources available. Um, I know my specialty society, the American Psychiatric Association have some, and, and others, uh, mental health organizations have 1-800 uh, numbers uh, where folks can call um, if they feel like they are getting into trouble. Again, not, not the, the usual and transient uh, symptoms. And of course, those who already uh, had uh, diagnoses, uh, we wanna make sure, uh, and I will just remind them uh, to stay in close contact uh, with their uh, physician or their, their therapist uh, to make sure they are supported getting through this. Um, I do worry, you know, again, uh, as you mentioned in my introduction, um, you know, pre-COVID-19, uh, we were dealing in this country with an opioid epidemic, and uh, I've been focusing on making sure there is equitable access to treatment for those who have a substance use disorder. And so I know I've seen uh, the availability of online support groups um, with this, but that, that is a worry. And so we uh, certainly need to make sure that is on top of mind. I know some states uh, have implemented a mental health hotline. 
I would encourage uh, uh, other uh, states to do so um, as they can um, so that any issues that come up, uh, citizens know they have a place to go and that there is some support during this time of crisis. Question from a member, what can we do to convince religious leaders to switch to online and phone services in place of large in-person gatherings? Here's where we need the partnership, again, everyone, because I've seen uh, many religious leaders encourage um, their, uh, their parishioners and their churches and mosques um, and, and uh, synagogues uh, to really refrain uh, from meeting in person. That gets back to our critical need to make sure that everyone is staying at home and sheltering in place. So here's a great uh, partnership for uh, ministers and rabbis uh, and pastors um, who know and, and are uh, working within their own religious institutions to remind everyone that we all have to act together. We all have that responsibility, uh, taking responsibility to stay at home and not. And I know this is a holy time for everyone, uh, but we can still experience this time, or I know this is a holy time for many, uh, we can still experience uh, those services remotely. What scams should people be aware of regarding COVID-19? So my general recommendation is to always, and I actually recommend this uh, even pre-COVID-19, is to have a healthy dose of skepticism. Uh, ask why and ask who. Um, I can not tell you the number of emails uh, that I receive um, asking, telling me that someone has PPE or, or ventilators. And I, I know, our, I can imagine, I don't know, but I can imagine that hospitals, uh, other physicians are, are getting the same. And so that's, again, is another reason why uh, we need, and it would be best if we had a federally coordinated uh, system looking at this, triaging, purchasing, uh, distributing needed um, supplies uh, again, so we wouldn't have to be so worried about uh, these scams. But so I would ask everyone uh, to have a healthy dose of skepticism uh, when you are offered any equipment um, or uh, anything and really let the large systems in the state um, and the federal government really triage and, and uh, respond to those logistics. We've also heard about some scams involving people taking money uh, for testing that turned out to be bogus testing. Um, what should people be watchful for there? I would say the same, have a healthy dose of skepticism. Make sure you contact your local um, and state public health departments or your hospitals and really take cues from them. Um, anyone who says they, they have testing and they're not affiliated either with uh, the state government or public health or hospital or physician's offices and established physician office uh, should really be skepti uh, skeptical. Can you speak about the importance of protecting the adults and children in the immigration camps as well as in our prison community? Yes, the, these are both huge issues because any issue where people are congregating um, is an issue. And of course, some of us have the privilege of making that voluntary decision, uh, but some don't. And we cannot forget uh, those who are in our prisons and jails. Um, I'm particularly attuned to that in jails because unfortunately jails have come become the de facto uh, mental health hospital in the time, again, pre-COVID-19. So there is an obligation to have conversations about those populations. And there's an obligation for leaders and those in charge uh, to make sure as best they can, uh, they mitigate the risk of patients uh, or, or those who are in jails and prison, prisons and in our immigration centers, mitigate the risk of them uh, contracting COVID-19 and spreading COVID-19. So it has to be a part of the conversation, um, any of our leadership conversation. Everyone deserves, uh, you know, basic opportunities around health. Uh, that's our obligation. 
and uh, hopefully that continues to be a, a conversation. And, I, and just a little segue about privilege. <clears throat> That's a different privilege. I, I talked about the privilege of voluntary social distancing, physical distancing. Not everyone has that privilege. And I just want to make that point. Um, you know, not everyone has a large home that they could even uh, have folks in the family uh, be able to distance themselves. I was reminded early on in uh, the pandemic that as we are requesting that everyone wash their hands, wash their hands, wash their hands, which we are, uh, if you are homeless, uh, you may not have running water. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, absolutely, if you can, walk around your neighborhood and, and get the exercise with family, physical distancing, but not everyone, uh, you know, has sidewalks and well-lit sidewalks. And so um, we have to make sure that um, uh, we are speaking to everyone and, and have recommendations uh, for, for everyone. And again, those who are in maybe lower wage jobs, I mentioned those who are cleaning facilities and, and, and um, some of those jobs, they don't have the privilege of staying at home or working from home. So, so that's another way that the rest of us who have that privilege can uh, make sure that everyone is as safe as possible. We've heard comparisons um, to Pearl Harbor and September 11 when talking about the COVID-19 crisis. Those instances involved moments of shock followed by understanding and retaliation. Um, this has come on over the course of time and gotten significantly worse. Could we, under any reasonable circumstance, have been ready for what we're seeing happen now? What are some of the lessons to be learned from this? Well, I will have to say there will be and should be after action uh, reports um, after we get through the worst uh, of, of this uh, pandemic. And of course, uh, the AMA uh, will be there and uh, definitely want to lead the conversation. <clears throat> so there will be, be time for that. I, I want to make sure we are focused right now on the immediate crisis. We want to make sure that uh, those who are in our hot spots uh, get through this. And we really want to prevent uh, the rest of the country uh, from becoming a hot spot. I will say just one lesson though that is clear and that needs to happen right now is again, just coordination. Um, I think that will be one of many lessons uh, to be learned um, that certainly the partnership and coordination is critical. Uh, but let's, uh, and let's save a little bit of this for the after action review right now and focus on uh, the immediate uh, impact and the immediate needs regarding uh, this pandemic. You mentioned the reporters and, and their jobs um, in your prepared remarks. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the role of journalists in helping inform the public as we all find our way through this crisis. Um, tell us why, in your opinion, journalism matters in a public health crisis like this. Well, it's important to get out accurate information. And so journalism uh, does matter. And in fact, and, and of course, it matters more in a crisis because people are susceptible and hearing information for, from a lot, of, a lot of sources, some of them not credible. So it really heightens the need uh, for objective uh, journalism. And again, pre-COVID-19, I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, speak um, at a symposium uh, with uh, media and members of the media and journalists about reporting on uh, the opioid use disorder, for, for instance, and the language and whether the language is stigmatizing. So journalism and the media have always played a role in making sure that um, there's credible, accurate information out there. And certainly uh, that becomes even more acute in times of crisis. And if you care to venture um, a thought, uh, what kind of a job do you think the press is doing in covering the story so far? 
Um, I believe that there uh, are so many wonderful uh, journalists and members of the media uh, that are doing a great job of getting the facts out. And I commend those who are doing a great job of making sure that the facts are, are there. Uh, and for any members of the media who, uh, and I will let them do a self-assessment uh, who are not, uh, I hope that the words, my words today, and of course, not just me, the team, the words from the AMA uh, really encourage everyone, not just the media, but everyone uh, to look uh, to science. You know, it's, science has been under assault for some time now. And uh, we have to make sure that we hold up uh, science and we are led by the science uh, going forward. And again, that was one of the reasons, many reasons um, the AMA uh, wanted to do this address today. There's so much to absorb and process uh, in this crisis. I'm interested in knowing if there are particular things that I don't necessarily want to say keep you up at night, but things you think about uh, in the course of a day and an evening. There are a lot. Um, you know, I, I worry about patience. Um, I want to make sure that um, I, I, we are ready in a worst case uh, scenario. Uh, physicians and again, other health professionals are ready in a worst case scenario uh, to offer them the services that they need. And, and, and I want to say, just make a plug for understanding public health. Public health is somewhat difficult to understand because public health works when nothing happens. And you have to take in that moment, nothing happens. And that, that's a good thing. And, and I, um, that, that's one lesson that I hope, again, we, we, we learn is the, the importance of, of public health and a good public health infrastructure. And that, um, and it's always hard to prove a negative, uh, but, but certainly uh, when things, the worst doesn't happen, um, it's going to be a combination of our individual actions, but, but those individual actions, the recommendations about staying home are informed by good, basic public health practices. So uh, I, I want people to know about that, but I'm most worried about um, the patients who are at risk and, and I want uh, us as a nation to do everything possible. I worry about my colleagues. You know, I, as I said, I believe perhaps in one of my addresses uh, since I've been pres uh, president, physicians don't run away from problems. Uh, we run towards them but there's an accountability contract there that as we are running towards these problems, we, we accept some level of risk when we choose this profession, but there's an accountability contract that when we do, um, everyone else is making sure that we are safe. And it's, it's, it's about physicians, but it's also about their families. It keeps me up at night and I worry. Again, I could, I could go an hour with all the things that I worry about, several hours. Um, but it's, it's, it's been heartbreaking uh, to hear my colleagues talking about um, updating their wills or writing a will. It's been heartbreaking uh, to see them uh, live apart from families. And so I want to make sure that, um, you know, physicians, uh, we are a trusted uh, profession. We will always strive to do so. Um, and, I, and I think I want to make sure that we, not just physicians, though, but all healthcare workers are protected uh, during uh, this time of crisis. And, and I do worry about the disproportionate impact in, in an earlier question and, uh, uh, on uh, communities of color. I worry about those in under or low resource areas. Uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, it wouldn't take much in an area that doesn't have a hospital or it has a tiny hospital that covers a lot of rural areas, um, may not have broadband. Um, so I worry about uh, those communities who may be low resourced or under resourced. So those are just a few of the things uh, that, that I worry about. Thank you, our time is up. Dr. Patrice Harris, we'd like to present you virtually um, with our notable National Press Club coffee mug along with our hope that we can share a cup of coffee here at the Press Club in person in the very near future. Thank you for joining us today. 
thank you for having me and thank you. I will enjoy that mug. My thanks to our National Press Club production team. To all, stay well, stay safe, and have a good day.